I think we'll just wait a few minutes um, as people enter um, and then we'll get started uh, pretty quickly because I know Christine has um, has a hard stop at uh, at noon. So we're going to try to make sure that uh, we can get through her presentation and have some some time for a Q&A at the end. Let's see, and I hope that everyone um, has looked at our schedule. We have lots of things scheduled between now and the 27th. Um, it's all on cleanair.org slash greenfest. Um, we have, last I checked, uh, about 30 things between this past Saturday and uh, two Sundays from now. So there's lots of fun, uh, fun things to learn and fun interactive live streams and webinars to participate in. Um, I think we can just get started. Um, again, hello and welcome to Clean Air Council's first ever virtual Green Fest Philly presented by Toyota Hybrids. I'm Bobby Safransky, the events director here at the council. Um, if you're not familiar with Green Fest, it's been the area's largest environmental festival celebrating all things sustainable for the past 15 years. This year is the first year that we're doing it entirely virtual for reasons that you should be aware of. Um, it has live and interactive programming scheduled um, from this past Saturday the 12th through Sunday September 27th. Um, you can see the full list of events at cleanair.org slash greenfest or on the Facebook event, um, which where you can RSVP and get notifications for everything as they're added or changed. We are still having things added every day. So um, go there for all the latest news. I'm here virtually with Christine Urbanowitz. Christine is a field ecologist and spatial analyst who studies the effects of environmental change on plants, pollinators, and species interactions. Um, like I said earlier, uh, she does have a hard stop at noon, um, so we're hoping to have time for questions at the end. But if you guys still have lingering questions, I can forward them to Christine and, and, and we can uh, post them on our website, post her answers on the website. Um, while the webinar is happening, you can ask any questions you have in the chat and I'll keep an eye on that and uh, bring them up to Christine uh, as she's in between slides. Um, Christine, you can go ahead now. Thanks, Bobby. All right. Mm -hmm. All right. Can you just confirm you can see that? Yep, you're all set. Thank you. All right, so today I'm going to be talking about bees because they're amazing. I've done a PhD, a master's um, degree, and two postdocs on bees. So I know a little bit about them and I want to share some of that with you and also tell you how they're doing and how you can help because I think there's a lot of hope. Hey, can you actually see the little faces too that are so, there we go. Um, okay, so we're gonna have a bit of a fun game here. I'm going to play Who Wants to Be a Billionaire? So um, if you could open either a new tab or go on your phone and navigate to tiny.cc slash bgame. Um, and I'll just give you a minute to do that. And um, Bobby, if you could just monitor the chat to see if anybody's having problems or if people can confirm in the chat that it's working for you. I will also paste that URL in the chat so people can just click on it um, in case they're awesome. having trouble navigating there. Okay, so you're gonna go to that and you're gonna type in your name and then throughout the presentation, I'm gonna be asking you um, questions. So every time I ask a question, you're going to hit the next button and answer the question. Um, and then at the end, we'll figure out who wins. So right now you can just type in your name. You can hit next if you want. And I'll get to the first question soon. All right. Any problems showing up, Bobby? Not yet. The chat looks fine. Sweet. All right. All right. So we study bees because bees are really important pollinators. And just so we're all on the same page with that, plants need to reproduce. So they need to produce seeds and fruit. 
And they can't just go walking over to another flower and giving pollen from a male flower to a female flower. So they need some kind of intermediary. So bees are the perfect intermediary. Um, so bees will visit a flower, collect pollen, go to another flower, and then while they're eating, they're going to deposit some of that flower, uh, that pollen. That pollen fertilizes an ovule, and from there you get fruit. Um, which plant do you think does not require pollinators? So if you go hit next, is it A, coffee, B, watermelon, C, almonds, or D, grapes? Um, and I'm just gonna um, count in my head for 15 seconds and then uh, we'll, I'll give you the answer. Okay, so the answer is D, grapes. Um, grapes have these small little white green flowers that are not very attractive to pollinators. They don't eat pollinators. They can self or wind pollinate. Uh, coffee, watermelon, almonds, and so many other crops require or benefit from insect or animal pollination. So about 35% of crop production and 87% of all flowering plants need pollinators. And these crops are some of the most delicious ones, like uh, different colorful fruits and berries, um, almonds, coffee, chocolate, all require um, pollinators. And then of course, wildflowers are so important for um, animal habitat, animal food, and 87% of all flowering plants need these pollinators. So basically, pollinators are really important. Pollinators don't do this out of the goodness of their hearts. They don't go out there thinking, I'm going to help um, produce some flowers and seeds and fruits tonight. They go out to flower because they're looking to eat nectar and pollen. And what makes bees particularly good pollinators is that they are extremely messy. So when they're getting in that flower and collecting pollen and nectar, they're getting it all over their bodies. And that helps from when they go from one pollinator to the next, I'm sorry, one flower to the next, they're depositing that pollen that's stuck to their hairs. So bees are messy and they're hairy. And that's why they're one of the most important pollinators in the world. So question two. So if you click next, you should see this question now. So how many bee species are there in the world? A, 20. B200, C2000, or D20,000? I'll give you a few seconds. All right, so the answer is 20,000, probably more than 20,000. We just know about 20,000 species. You might think of, when you think of pollinators, probably think of honeybees, maybe bumblebees. Maybe you know about sweat bees. There are so many bees out there and they are so cool looking that I just wanted to show you some pictures of their diversity. Oops. So this is an orchid bee. You can find it in Costa Rica. This is our endangered bumblebee that you'll find in Pennsylvania if you're lucky. Um, it's Bombus affinis. It has a little rusty patch right here. This is a kind of sweat bee, and it's actually the same species, but on the left is the male bee, and on the right is the female bee. Um, they're sexually dimorphic. The male bee has these yellow stripes, and if you see its legs, it doesn't have so much hair because males don't do much. They mate, they don't collect pollen and bring it back to their nest. So they don't need all that hair to collect the pollen. All right, question number three. Which bee is the male bee? So we, are, we have two species, I mean, one species, one is male, one is female. Is it the left bee or the right bee? So the answer is it's the left bee. Um, you can see 
Hair, not so much on the left, or on the leg compared to the female. The antennae are a little longer. And most importantly for y'all, the females have a stinger and the males don't. Male bees don't sting, females do. They're going to be defending themselves and their little um, nests. So uh, anytime you get stung by a bee, you go, oh, he stung me, it's she stung me. Um, this is just another beautiful carpenter bee from the tropics with rainbow wings. This is another bee you'll find around here. It's a sweat bee. And this is my favorite bee. It's Pepinapis prunosa. It is an extremely picky eater. It only likes squash, cucumbers, and pumpkins. And imagine you only ate pizza the rest of your life. This is kind of what this bee does. In fact, it likes pizza or squash, cucumber, pumpkin so much that it will build its nest right next to these plants. That's like moving your house to your favorite pizzeria. And then it's so special that it has hairs that are specialized to pick up the shape of the squash, cucumber, pollen. And it also wakes up early in the morning, earlier than other bees, when those flowers open up early in the morning. So when you're having Thanksgiving dinner, you probably owe it to um, Pepinapis prunosa for your pumpkin pie. Actually, look, it's a female. It's got a stinger and hairy legs. All right, question number four. This is a messy bee and a good pollinator. True or false? So, this was a trick question. It's false. This is a hoverfly. Hoverflies um, mimic the look of bees. So you could be easily fooled, but now you can be the geek when you see a fly and people go, oh my gosh, it's a bee. No, look at its antennae. Its antennae are very short. That's a really good um, giveaway that it's a fly. Um, I wanted to bring this up though, because flies and other animals are also really important in pollinators. Um, so flies, bats, beetles, birds, butterflies, there are a lot of important pollinators out there. Um, you'll notice that one fly is the mosquito. This is one of the pollinators I studied in Greenland. And yes, mosquitoes are pollinators, which is kind of an upsetting fact. They're not very hairy, so they can't collect a lot of pollen, but there's so many of them that in force, they're a good pollinator. Uh, Bobby, do we have any questions before I keep going? Because this is a good stopping point. None yet. You're good to go. Sweet. Okay. So, number five. Most bee species live in large groups. True or false? So this is false. So when you think of bees, you might think of bumblebees or honeybees. Those are both social bees. Honeybees can live with tens of thousands of others. Bumblebees can live with tens to hundreds of others. Most bees though are solitary bees. That means they live alone. Um, what this means for you guys is that solitary bees aren't as aggressive as social bees because they don't have a huge nest to defend. Um, with their larvae and with honey. Solitary bees don't produce honey. Uh, and most bees in Pennsylvania, so there's about 450 species in Pennsylvania, um, most of these are solitary and most, uh, well, we'll get to that a little later. I don't want to give it away. Okay. So uh, question number six, like birds, bees build nests to lay their eggs. True or false? Okay, yeah, so this is true. Um, bees absolutely build nests. Uh, just like you might see a nest with a, a yellow jacket, there's those huge social nests, but when you think of these solitary bees, they're often nesting in the ground or in stems and cavities. So this is Pepinathus prunosa, that's a bee. It will um, dig holes in the ground. And each of these little yellow 
balls are a pollen ball, a pollen provision. So it goes out, collects pollen and nectar, rolls it up into a little ball and puts it down in a hole and then lays an egg on top of it. And as that egg develops, it will eat that pollen provision. And lots of bees are stem and cavity nesters. That means they'll find a rodent hole or the stem of a raspberry branch and um, build cocoons and nests in there. So uh, this is a leaf cutter bee. We have these in Pennsylvania. I love looking at them because they'll cut little leaves and you can see them floating back to their nests with their leaf cut out. And just like the ground nesting bee, it brings um, little pollen provisions, lays an egg on top. And then those eggs develop into larvae and that happens all winter um, until the following spring. So question number seven, how do bees spend most of their lives? Is it A, collecting pollen, B, looking for a mate, C, staying in their nest, or D, looking for their nest? Okay, so the answer is C, staying in their nest. So like I just said, um, so basically the life cycle of bees are that they emerge in the spring. They mate right away. The males die in about two weeks. The females die in about six weeks. During that six weeks, females are collecting pollen and nectar and making those pollen provisions and bringing them back to the nest where they're laying eggs on those pollen provisions. Most of their lives, the bees are developing and they're just in those nests. So I just wanted to share you, with you a really cute video. So this is a leaf cutter bee and it's emerging. Um, so they plucked the cocoon, the leaf cocoons out of the nest and just put them on a, looks like almost like a baby blanket. And um, it's the bee emerging from this cocoon. So I thought that was simply adorable. So if like you had any reservations about how cute insects could be, I mean, look at that little burrito, so cute. All right, now we're gonna get into um, what's happening with the bees. I hope I've given you a little bit more appreciation for why bees are important, but now are they in decline and why? So question number eight, terrestrial insect abundance has declined what percent per decade? And I see that I already gave the answer, 9%. Um, this is from a paper that was just published a few months ago. The, this is you know, a really troubling number, but it's a world average. And there's a lot of spatial variability. In some areas, bees are doing well. In other areas, bees aren't doing so well. And I shouldn't say bees, all terrestrial insects. Christine, um, we have a question. Oh, yes. Um, Carl asks, uh, are the pollen provisions the same as bee bread um, that bees make in the winter for storage? Yeah, so honeybees make bee bread. It, you can think of it as the same thing. Um, they have nectar, they're meant to be preserved for that amount of time, and they're fed to larvae, which is the uh, purpose of bee bread as well. All right, thank you, Bobby. So uh, between 2008 and 2013, wild bee abundance declined across 23% of the land area of the U.S. The red areas on this map show where bee, um, wild bee abundance has declined. So we're talking mostly of these solitary bees and some bumblebees. And the blue areas represent areas where wild bee abundance increased during just those five years. I thought this was super promising for Eastern PA because you can see we're blue which is amazing. Um, and the authors of this study think that has to do with conversion of land um, from agriculture back to more natural uses, shrubland or forest, maybe a decrease in pesticide use. 
All right, so when we think about threats to bees, there are many and they interact. What time it is. So we have habitat loss, pesticides, climate change, pathogens, and parasites. And by interact, I mean that one can affect the other and make things worse. So if you expose bees to pesticides, they're going to have um, a harder time fighting off a gut parasite, for example. This is something I actually studied. So we're going to be talking about two of these um, drivers, habitat loss and pesticides, because this is something you can um, improve uh, immediately and in your own backyard. So um, because of the time, I think I'm just going to invite you later to go on beescape.org. And this is going to give you kind of a report card for your area. Um, it's going to tell you around three kilometers or five kilometers of your house, your address, what the bee habitat is like. What are they experiencing when they come into your yard and what have they experienced in the neighborhood? It's going to give you information on nesting habitat, uh, the floral habitat, so spring, summer, and fall. And these, these habitats are based on land use and expert opinion. And then an insecticide score. The higher uh, the insecticide score, the worse. Um, the one thing I should mention with this is that it only looks at agricultural pesticides and insecticides. So it's not taking into account um, pesticides people might be spraying on their lawns. So yeah, I think it's a super cool tool if you want to look at that later. Uh, Christine, we had a question. Do we have time for questions or do you want to kind of push through? No, go ahead. Okay. Um, Lynn asked, uh, other than planting a pollinator garden, what else can, uh, can we do to help bees uh, with nesting, water reproduction, etc.? Perfect. That's exactly what I'm getting into in seven minutes. So, um, so habitat loss, what can you do? So there's lots of things that you just shouldn't do, like to be more lazy about things, and that will help the bees. If you mow less often, if you just add a week in between your mowings, let dandelions grow in your yard, um, that's going to increase bee diversity in your yard. Um, you can also plant different flowers. So what kind of flowers do you think you should plant to attract bees? Uh, red flowers, plants that bloom across the season, plants that bloom at the same time, or D, abundant, aggressive flowers. So the answer is B, flowers that bloom across the season. And you're going to want to use native plants. Um, if you use invasive, they're going to be abundant and aggressive and take over uh, your garden and not create this diversity of uh, floral resources that you need across the season to support bees across the season. I put red flowers in there because actually bees can't see red. Um, so they're not gonna do a very good job of attracting bees. Uh, we have a honey question actually. Um, Eric asks, uh, why do honey bees make so much honey? And would they use it all if they're not harvested by people? Yeah. They would use it all. Um, so this is kind of sad. It's like <laughs> we will take their honey and then replace it with sugar. Um, so they still have something. So the purpose of honey is so bees, honey bees with their very large colonies can overwinter and survive. So when we take their honey, we have to replace any that we think they need with, um, with some substitutes. Okay, so last thing for habitat loss, I think, don't remove old stumps and logs. Um, we have a lot of windstorms right now, and you might have fallen trees. Maybe you can just leave them there. It's safe, if it's safe. Um, bumblebees will nest in them, but also like these very cool swept bees love rotting wood. Oh, and finally, because of these ground nesting bees, we want to just give them patches of bare ground. So have a bit of an ugly yard, have patches of bare ground and mulch less. That's going to give them areas where they can chew through the dirt and um, create nests. All right, I think we're almost done. Okay, so the last question, and then um, 
I'll go through the slides a little bit faster. What pesticides are dangerous to bees? The A, fungicides, B, herbicides, C, insecticides, or D, all of the above. So yeah, it's all of the above. So insecticides are meant to kill insects. So of course they're gonna be dangerous to bees. The problem is that there's synergies between these um, pesticides. So one pesticide can make the effect of another worse, especially fungicides. So we found that fungicide application was related to bumblebee decline across the United States. And that's because it really increases the toxicity of insecticides. We have uh, two quick questions if you think we have time for it. Um, the yeah. first is from Catherine asking uh, about mosquitoes, not bees, but asking what they're doing on plants. Are they eating? Uh, what are they doing? They're collecting nectar. So mosquitoes, that's a very good question, Catherine. Thank my sister. Um, you know, they like to eat blood. Um, females will suck your blood, not the males. Kind of just like bees will only sting you if they're female. Um, so males are going to have to go to flowers for nectar. Females, if they can't find a blood meal, if they can't bite you or a bird or a different animal, they will also go to um, a flower for um, nectar. And that's how they collect their pollen. What was the other question, Bobby? Or was there another question? Yeah, the other question was from Logan about um, colony collapse disorder. Um, yeah. I think asking about that as, a, as an issue. Yeah, so colony collapse disorder is something to do with um, honeybees. And that was really big in the news uh, a few years ago. And it, um, it was shown that bees were dying a lot, and a lot of it was misdiagnosed as this colony collapse disorder. We now know that a lot of um, honeybees are dying for just like a whole plethora of reasons, but one of them has to do with the varroa mite. It's this mite that will attach itself to larvae and suck the fat bodies out of the larvae. So there's that and poor management skills, especially with hobbyists. Um, and then climate change, pesticides, um, not enough floral resources. These are all things that are um, hurting our honeybees. And a lot of these are also hurting our native bees. OK, so let me just, I'm, I'm, I have like a two minute buffer or something. So. so pesticides, what can you do? So use fewer pesticides, especially something you'll see as neonicotinoids. They're abbreviated neonics. These um, target the nervous system of insects and they are highly, highly toxic to honeybees or to all bees. Um, if you have to use pesticides, spray pesticides after mowing. Mowing's gonna remove those flowers so you're not spraying pesticides on a bee's food source. And then spray early in the morning or late in the afternoon when bees aren't so active. Um, I'll maybe share this with um, Bobby later, but there's just a lot of ways you can help us collect data. We actually don't know a lot about where bumblebees and other bees nest. There's an amazing new initiative called Queen Quest where we're um, searching the ground, looking for these overwintering habitats. The oldest citizen science project is called Great Sunflower Project. Um, you'll go out, you'll um, grow one sunflower and count the bees on it to kind of have a control. And then there's a new app you might want to check out called Earth Challenge App. They're having people take pictures of bees to count them and then train artificial intelligence to identify bees automatically. Okay, let's see if I can do this real quick. Okay, I can't. Oh, that's disappointing. Well, hopefully you should have your score at the, let's see if I can just get out of it, uh, end of this. Aha, okay, whoever called themselves bees, um, you won! Congratulations! I see Bob B there and be prepared. Awesome job, guys. Um, I unfortunately have to go to another meeting. Um, uh, I'm going to leave some of these resources up here. And um, Bobby has my contact information. I'm also on Twitter. Um, but right now I need to go to a training, unfortunately.
Okay. Thank you so much, Christine. We really all appreciated it and it was an amazing presentation. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. I'm gonna um, see if I can leave this now. <laughs> yeah, and I'll take questions from Bobby later. Okay, bye. Okay, thanks, Christine, bye. Well, everyone, I hope you all enjoyed it. Um, it was very informative. Uh, and I hope you all have an increased appreciation for these pollinators. Um, we do have one lingering question from, uh, from Nancy about wasps being enemies to bees. Um, I will present that to, um, uh, to Christine and uh, Nancy. I actually have, uh, if you RSVP, I should have your email address so I can send you that answer. Um, I'll also post it uh, when I uh, post the, the video of this webinar. Um, on our recap page. If you go to green or cleaner.org slash greenfest, uh, there will be links to our recap page where we have all of these recorded webinars for people to watch after the fact. If you missed it, or if you um, maybe were doing something during the webinar and want more information about it that you might have missed during the webinar. But I'll post the answer um, that I get from Christine on there too. Um, again, you can see everything scheduled for this year's greenfest at cleanair.org slash greenfest. Be sure to RSVP for the Facebook event to get notifications for newly added or updated webinars. Um, and thanks again for being with us today. Uh, on behalf of Clean Air Council, I hope to see you a few more times throughout the festival. Thanks. <laughs>